Around the World Chapter 17, showing what happened on the voyage from Singapore to Hong Kong. Now remember, the detective is pretending he doesn't know anything. And pass a part out, just likes to talk. So he's telling the detective stuff he shouldn't. But there is some things the detective didn't know about, like how did they get Aouda and all those things. So he's learning all this stuff out. And remember, he wants, he believes that uh, Passepartout's master is a robber, but he's not. All right, let's go with chapter 17. <clears throat> the detective and Passepartout met often on deck after this interview, though Fix was reserved and did not attempt to induce his companion to divulge any more facts concerning Mr. Fogg. He caught a glimpse of that mysterious gentleman once or twice, but Mr. Fogg usually confined himself to the cabin where he kept Aouda company, or according to his inveterate habit, took a hand at whist. Passepartout began very seriously to conjecture what strange chance kept Fix still on the route that his master was pursuing. It was really worth considering why this certain, very amiable and complacent person, whom he had first met at Suez, had then encountered on board the Mongolia, who disembarked at Bombay, which he announced as his destination, and now turned up so unexpectedly on the Rangoon, was following Mr. Fogg's track step by step. What was Fix's object? Passepartout was ready to wager his Indian shoes, which he religiously preserved, that Fix would also leave Hong Kong at the same time with them, and probably on the same steamer. <clears throat> Passepartout might have cudgeled his brain for a century without hitting upon the real object which the detective had in view. He never could have imagined that Phileas Fogg was being tracked as a robber around the globe, but as it is in human nature to attempt a solution of every mystery, Passepartout suddenly discovered an explanation of Fix's movements, which was in truth far from unreasonable. Fix, he thought, could only be an agent of Mr. Fogg's friends at the Reform Club, sent to follow him up and to ascertain that he really went round the world as he agreed upon. It's clear, repeated the worthy servant to himself, proud of his shrewdness, he's a spy sent to keep us in view. That isn't quite the thing either to be spying Mr. Fogg, who is so honorable a man, Ah, oh, gentlemen of the Reform, this shall cost you dear. Pass a part out, enchanted with his discovery, it's not resolved to say nothing to his master, lest he should be justly offended at this mistrust on the part of his adversaries. But he determined to chafe Fix, when he had the chance, with mysterious allusions, which, however, need not betray his real suspicions. During the afternoon of Wednesday, 30th October, the Rangoon entered the Strait of Malacca, which separates the peninsula of that name from Sumatra. The mountainous and craggy islets intercepted the beauties of this noble island, from the view of the travelers. The Rangu weighed anchor at Singapore the next day at 4 a.m. to receive coal. Having gained half a day on the prescribed time of her arrival, Phileas Fogg noted this gain in his journal and then, accompanied by Uda, who portrayed a desire for a walk on shore, disembarked. Fix, who suspected Mr. Fogg's every movement, followed them cautiously without being himself perceived, while Passapart out, laughing in his sleeve at Fix's maneuvers, went about his usual errands. The island of Singapore is not imposing in aspect, for there are no mountains, yet its appearance is not without attractions. It is a park checkered by pleasant highways and avenues. A handsome carriage drawn by a sleek pair of New Holland horses carried Phileas Fogg and Aouda into the midst of rows of palms with brilliant foliage and of clove trees, whereof the cloves form the heart of a half-open flower. Pepper plants replaced the prickly hedges of European fields. Sago bushes, large ferns with glorious branches, varied the aspect of this tropical clime, while nutmeg trees in full foliage filled the air with a penetrating perfume. Agile and grinning bands of monkeys skipped about in the trees, nor were tigers wanting in the jungles. After a drive of two hours through the country, Aouda and Mr. Fox returned to the town, which is a vast collection of heavy-looking irregular houses, surrounded by charming gardens, rich in tropical fruits and plants, and at 10 o'clock they re-embarked, closely followed by the detective who had kept them constantly in sight. Pass a part out who had been purchasing several dozen mangoes, a fruit as large as good-sized apples of a dark brown color outside and a bright red within, and whose white pulp melted in the mouth affords gourmands a delicious sensation, was waiting for them on deck. 
He was only too glad to offer some mang mangoes to Aouda, who thanked him very gracefully for them. At 11 o'clock, the Rangoon rode out of Singapore Harbor, and in a few hours, the high mountains of Malacca, with their forests inhabited by the most beautifully furred tigers in the world, were lost to view. Singapore is distant some 1,300 miles from the island of Hong Kong, which is a little English colony near the Chinese coast. Phileas Fogg hoped to accomplish the journey in six days so as to be in time for the steamer which would leave on the 6th of November for Yokohama, the principal Japanese port. The Rangoon had a large quota of passengers, many of whom disembarked at Singapore, among them a number of Indians, Ceylonese, Chinamen, Malays, and Portuguese, mostly second-class tra travelers. The weather, which had hitherto been fine, changed with the last quarter of the moon. The sea rolled heavily, and the wind at intervals rose almost to a storm, but happily blew from the southwest and thus aided the steamer's progress. The captain, as often as possible, put up his sails, and under the double action of steam and sail, the vessel made rapid progress along the coast of Annam and Cochin, China. Owing to the defective construction of the Rangoon, however, unusual precautions became necessary in unfavorable weather. But the loss of time which resulted from this cause, while it nearly drove Passapartout out of his senses, did not seem to affect his master in the least. Passapartout blamed the captain, the engineer, and the crew, and consigned all who were connected with the ship to the land where the pepper grows. Perhaps the thought of the gas, which was remorselessly burning at his expense in Seville Row, had something to do with his hot impatience. Remember, he thinks he left the gas on in his room, and his master's making him pay for it. <coughs> <coughs> you are in a great hurry, then, said Fix to him one day, to reach Hong Kong. A very great hurry. Mr. Fogg, I suppose, is anxious to catch the steamer for Yokohama? Terribly anxious. You believe in this journey around the world, then? Absolutely. Don't you, Mr. Fix? I? I don't believe a word of it. You're a sly dog, said Passapart out, winking at him. This expression rather disturbed Fix without his knowing why. Had the Frenchman guessed his real purpose? He knew no, not what to think. But how could Passapart out have discovered that he was a detective? Yet in speaking as he did, the man evidently meant more than he expressed. Passapart out went still further the next day. He could not hold his tongue. Mr. Fix, said he in a bantering tone, shall we be so unfortunate as to lose you when we get to Hong Kong? Why, responded a Fix, a little embarrassed. I don't know, perhaps. Ah, if you would only go on with us, an agent of the Peninsular Company, you know, can't stop on the way. You are only going to Bombay, and here you are in China. America is not far off, and from America to Europe is only a step. Fix looked intently at his companion, whose countenance was as serene as possible, and laughed with him. But Passapart out persisted in chafing him by asking him if he made much by his present occupation. Yes and no, returned Fix. There is good and bad luck in some things, but you must understand that I don't travel at my own expense. Oh, I am quite sure of that, cried Passapart out, laughing heartily. Fix, fairly puzzled, descended to his cabin and gave himself up to his reflections. He was evidently suspected. Somehow or other, the Frenchman had found out that he was a detective. But had he told his master, what part was he playing in all this? Was he an accomplice or not? Was the game then up? Fix spent several hours turning these things over in his mind, sometimes thinking that all was lost, then persuading himself that Fogg was ignorant of his presence, and then undecided what course it was best to take. Nevertheless, he preserved his coolness of mind and at last resolved to deal plainly with Passapart out. If he did not find it practicable to arrest Fogg at Hong Kong, and if Fogg made preparations to leave that last foothold of English ter territory, he, Fix, would tell Passapart out all. Either the servant was the accomplice of his master, and in this case, the master knew of his operations, and he should fail. Or else the servant knew nothing about the robbery, and then his interest would be to abandon the robber. Such was the situation between Fix and Passapart out. Meanwhile, Phileas Fogg moved about above them in the most majestic and unconscious indifference, he was passing methodically in his orbit around the world, regardless of the lesser stars which gravitated around him. Yet there was nearby what the astronomers would call a disturbing star, which might have produced an agitation in this gentleman's heart. But no, the charms Aouda failed to act, to pass part out's great surprise, and the disturbances, if they existed, would have been more difficult to calculate than those of Uranus, which led to the discovery of Neptune. 
It was every day an increasing wonder to pass a part out who read in Aouda's eyes the depths of her gratitude to his master. Phileas Fogg, though brave and gallant, must be, he thought, quite heartless. As to the sentiment which this journey might have awakened in him, there was clearly no trace of such a thing, while poor Passapart out existed in perpetual reveries. One day, he was leaning on the railing of the engine room and was observing the engine, when a sudden pitch of the steamer threw the screw out of the water. The steam came hissing out of the valves, and this made Passapart out indignant. The valves are not sufficiently charged, he exclaimed. We are not going. Oh, these English, if this was an American craft, we should blow up, perhaps. But we should at all events go faster. That's chapter 17.